Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to today's event, LDC Reflections of 2020. My name is Juliet Tunstall. I'm the External Events Officer here at the International Institute for Environment and Development. Really delighted to be here with you today and really looking forward to the discussion when we're, where we're going to hear reflections from on the past year from climate leaders from the least developed countries and also look forward at the year ahead. Today's event is the first IID debates um, of the year for any participants who haven't joined an IID debate event before. The, the aim of the series is to bring together an international community to discuss key and current sustainable development issues. And that is it from me. Um, I will now hand over to Andrew Norton, who is the director of IIED and the moderator for today's session. Thank you. Thanks so much, Juliet. Um, it's my pleasure to be mon moderating this event and a warm welcome to our, our virtual audience. Uh, thank you very much for being part of this discussion. And today we're very fortunate to be joined by climate leaders from the least developed countries and also by a representative from the UK COP26 presidency. Um, and I will in introduce the panelists shortly. We're going to hear reflections and perspectives from the LDC climate leaders as we look back at the key events and diplomatic moments over the last year and look forward at what is to come in 2021, which has been dubbed a super year. But of course, going forward, we need a super decade. Um, one good year isn't gonna be enough. Um, and it goes without saying as well that this past year was a year like no other. Uh, due to the global pandemic, high level climate meetings and international conventions were postponed or adapted. Um, we don't know much about how that will go roll forward over the coming year, and that's something to consider today. But despite the challenges and uncertainties, there were many positive significant moments for climate action that indicate major shifts. To name a few, we had the Placentia Ambition Forum organized by AOSIS, the Small Island States Forum, um, which focused on safeguarding the Paris Agreement and particularly its environmental integrity. Um, and of course, um, late in the year, very positively, we had the US elections and a huge change in direction, energy and engagement from uh, one of the world's biggest emitters and most important countries. And that's also enormously important. Uh, we had the Timpu Ambition Summit hosted by the chair of the LDCs and the Climate Ambition Summit where 45 nations came forward with enhanced uh, NDCs, nationally determined contributions. And we also heard in September, um, very importantly, China's commitment uh, to achieve net zero in terms of carbon by 2060, which again, like the US election, hopefully is a game changer and will accelerate action and ambition. And today's event also takes place off the back of the Climate Adaptation Summit, um, hosted by the Netherlands earlier this week, um, where IID was heavily engaged on themes of getting money where it matters, of delivering climate finance to the front line of the climate crisis and supporting um, the structures and the power structures that are needed to make locally led adaptation a reality. And of course, intertwined in all of this activity and in each of our personal and professional lives is the COVID-19 pandemic, which has generated this massive, unprecedented global health, economic and social crisis. Um, COVID has e exposed and deepened inequalities. Um, Oxfam has just published a report, The Inequality Virus, um, which kind of points out remarkably that this may well be the first time in recorded history that inequality has increased in virtually every country in the world at the same time. And we know also that at the top end, people have not suffered. Throughout 2020, um, that Oxfam have calculated that, that it will take just nine months for the fortunes, or it took just nine necessary. months for the fortunes of the world's poorest to global billionaires pandemic, to return to their government to rapid action. While, while for the world's poorest, recovery could take more than a decade. So given all of this, how did the world fare in terms of climate action and ambition in 2020? And what will it take to enhance action for people, climate and nature in the years to come? That is what our panel speakers are here to discuss. So let me introduce them now. We have Cecilia Silva Bernardo, who is the Director for Cooperation of the Ministry of Culture, Tourism and Environment of the Republic of Angola. 
Cecilia is also a negotiator for Angola and the LDCs. And currently she is co-chair of the Adaptation Committee of the UNFCCC, although she's speaking here as an LDC negotiator in that capacity. I'm delighted to welcome Matsumi Malajani, who leads the LDC Expert Group um, and the National Adaptation Plans Unit of the UNFCCC Secretariat, um, which is responsible for the process to formulate and implement national adaptation plans, national adaptation programs of action, NAPAs, and the LDC work program. He is from Lesotho and is a former chair of the LDC group. Also delighted to welcome Gladys Harbu, who is a UNICEF Pacific, Pacific supporter and supports the work of the Pacific Islands students fighting climate change for the Solomon Islands. She's a pharmacist at the Solomon Islands National Referral Hospital, and you can read a great blog that she wrote about loss and damage on IIED's website. Please do look at that. And um, we, I'm also delighted to welcome Brianna Kraft, who is a senior researcher in IIED's Climate Change Research Group. She supports the Least Developed Countries Group at the UN, United Nations Framework on Climate Change Negotiations. She works with LDC representatives to negotiate outcomes on technology development and transfer that benefit the world's poorest. And Brianna has been part of our core team at IID supporting the LDCs for many years. We're delighted to have her here. Um, and our final panelist who I'll come to after the main discussion for sort of reflections as a discussant, um, delighted to welcome Hugh Davis. Um, the success of COP26 will depend greatly on the leadership of the UK as COP26 president. Um, Hugh Davis is the deputy lead negotiator for the UK COP26 presidency team who will respond to the LDC reflection after the panel discussion and share the presidency's plans and priorities for the year ahead. Welcome Hugh, we're delighted you could join us. Um, and to start off this session, we have, I'm delighted to say we have some welcoming remarks from Sonam P. Wangdi from the Kingdom of Bhutan, who is the chair of the Least Developed Countries Group on Climate Change. We'll then have the panel discussion followed by Hugh and then followed by audience Q&A. Distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, hello and greetings from Bhutan and the Least Developed Countries Group. It is my pleasure to be speaking to you today, and I thank IIED for convening this important event to bring to the four LDCs reflections of 2020 and ambitions for 2021. The world is dealing with multiple crises, the climate crisis, unprecedented biodiversity loss, rising inequalities, and now COVID-19 pandemic. What 2020 has taught us is that we cannot deal with one crisis in isolation from others. While governments around the world are making major investments in COVID-19 recovery plans, these plans should place people, climate and nature at its core. 2020 was a year for the history books and the least developed countries faced several challenges adapting to the new normal. Increased virtual engagement has been a key element, but COVID-19 drastically impacted our climate diplomacy, decreasing its frequency and intensity. The time zone management and limited internet bandwidth in many least developed countries remained acute challenges during this period. These issues impact the LDC's representation in international climate forums and several LDCs reported delays to their national NDC and NAP processes. Despite challenges, the LDCs strove to maintain momentum, bring our constituency together and push for climate action. We used a series of virtual interactions to draw together positions and priorities. And this all culminated when our group hosted the virtual Timpu Ambition Summit in December. The summit showcased LDC's leadership on climate action and demonstrated the need for international community to scale up climate finance in support of the vulnerable countries. Going into 2021, the LDC group 
will be pushing its priority, priorities across a number of fronts. It is crucial to see increased short-term climate actions between now and 2030 that close the emissions gap. This isn't the time for small steps to be taken. It's time for transformative changes across all aspects of society. We must see enhanced, more ambitious NDCs delivered, as well as long-term strategies that put the world on track to meeting the goals of the Paris Agreement. The science tells us we cannot delay action. Secondly, we must see developed countries scale up support for developing countries for climate actions, including through the delivery of $100 billion climate finance. We look forward to beginning deliberations at COP26 on a new finance goal that is based on science and the needs of developing countries. And as virtual and remote engagement continues, negotiating and decision-making must be inclusive. Efforts must be made to ensure processes and meetings are well represented. Throughout 2020, <coughs> we saw that swift and bo bold movement is both possible and necessary. In response to this global pandemic, governments took rapid action at scale, mobilized vast public resources, and responded to the signs. Individuals changed their behavior to minimize the risk for others. It is clear that early and informed action saves lives, reduces costs, and minimizes impacts. Let us learn from this so that 2021 sets the stage for a low carbon and climate resident future for all. I thank you and touch the link. Well, it was excellent to have those words from um, the LDC chair from Bhutan. And I should also say Bhutan has given fantastic leadership to the LDC group um, over the last couple of years. So um, huge thanks to Sun MP Wangdi and to the Kingdom of Bhutan for that. Let's move on to the discussion now um, with the panel. And to kick off the conversation, I'd like the speakers to take, well, the first question is, I'm gonna go around the room for all the speakers, but uh, will you reflect on, would you like to reflect on 2020's major diplomatic moments? And in your opinion, what was one of the greatest highs and one of the shocking lows? So Cecilia, could I start with you for that, please? Um, thank you, uh, um, Andrew. Um, hello, everyone. Um, well, very quickly, for me, um, it, it was certainly the COVID-19 pandemic delaying the climate action um, and the US uh, election process that uh, uh, culminated with uh, Joe Biden election and uh, the consequent US return to the Paris Agreement. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cecilia. Matsumi, how, what would be your highs and lows? Thank you very much, Andrew, and uh, greetings to everyone across the globe. Um, for us, I think one of the important things is that despite the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, which uh, crippled almost every part of our activities, uh, parties and of course the global community uh, co remains committed on climate action. Uh, you would remember that we organized two big events last year. There was the June Momentum on Climate Change events that were organized by subsidiary body chairs, as well as the UN Climate Dialogues that happened in November, December. Both these events were very well attended and uh, the participants were very well engaged, very much engaging uh, beyond what we could have anticipated as the action. Apart from that, of course, we also still see parties despite the constraints still submitting their updated NDCs, uh, their national adaptation plans, the long-term strategies and the adaptation communications. Of course, the rate is not as high as one would expect, but I think these are some of the things that show commitment uh, by the global community on the climate crisis. Thank you. Thank you, Matsumi. We'll be returning to some of those things, I'm sure, during the discussion. Um, Gladys, what would be your, your high and your low of 2020? Thank you very much, Andrew, and hello to everyone that's um, watching now. Um, so I guess 
my greatest high um, would be di digital diplomacy, um, especially coming from a third world country and seeing people making more use of technology or the e-world to um, help um, achieve the diplomatic objectives, especially in the climate space is really important. And a good example um, for me was um, MOCCOP 26, which I was a part of as an um, event coordinator. And we, we managed to have 140 countries represented um, through 330 delegates, which was a huge success. Um, but coming to the shocking low, I'd say, um, starting from the Australian uh, bushfires to literally seeing how something small like COVID-19 can um, flip the world around. Um, but at the same time, still seeing climate change intensify in our islands, especially with Cyclone um, Harold, uh, Harold, sorry, last year, where we lost over 20 lives and yet we still haven't lost any lives with COVID-19. I think that's um, something that's very shocking to me. Thank you very much and a fantastic perspective on the discussion there. Thanks, Gladys. Brianna, what would be your high and your low? Thanks. Uh, hello, everyone. Good to be here with you all today and greetings to the panelists as well. Uh, Cecilia, you stole my highs and lows, so I'm going to echo your wise words. Um, my lows, well, my low had to be the pandemic and it's various impacts on all aspects of life, including the climate diplomacy that we had so looked forward to in 2020. Uh, as a climate researcher, it was striking to watch the serious seriousness with which leaders responded uh, to scientists' warnings about COVID and the willingness of individuals to completely change their lives um, in order to save the lives of others. Um, I would love if we could follow such precedent in uh, trying to confront the climate crisis and hopefully avoid even more tragic loss of life. Um, so from the low, there was also this uh, cognitive dissonance between how we deal with one crisis and how we don't deal with another. Uh, so that was quite a struggle. And that carried on into my high uh, as an American citizen, uh, the US election and its results um, were wonderful to see, um, especially as Gladys brought up in the wake of such visceral devastation, the worst hurricane season we've ever known, the worst wildfire season we've ever known, uh, to be followed by nothing um, from the previous administration. Uh, welcoming the new administration was quite the high and hearing uh, Biden speak to a climate just plan. That's probably the most ambitious I've ever had and <laughs> known an American administration to roll out just yesterday. It uh, still remains the high. So welcome uh, my country back to the Paris Agreement and the global effort on climate change. But yeah, thanks Cecilia for outlining those too. Yeah, no, I mean, we're all hugely glad about that, but perhaps feeling particularly for those of you who are American citizens and yesterday's executive orders had some fantastic stuff in. So that was great to see. Um, OK, brilliant. Um, I'd like to now pick up on a really important issue early on in the discussion, and that's the issue of climate finance. Cecilia, um, I'd like to address a two part question to you at this point. The first part of it is meeting the hundred billion climate finance target promise was supposed to be a milestone for 2020. Do you think developed countries have gone far enough on this? Um, wow, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and um, well, I would recognize that efforts were in place. Um, finance for adaptation has grown in recent years, but uh, um, more than two with 9% identified as serving both uh, adaptation and mitigation. So I think more needs to be done. Um, we still need to make sure that funds are uh, equitable allocated, um, because this is not happening yet. Um, instead, we, we see uh, um, an increase in loans instead of grants for, for, for the most vulnerable countries. And I, I wonder if it's really helping the most vulnerable that are now in addition are struggling uh, to respond to COVID-19 pandemic while their debts are increasing. So, uh, well, I, I don't think uh, um, enough 
was uh, was done. So as um, I think we all have uh, uh, had contact with the OECD, um, OECD report, and um, um, this report found that only 21% of climate finance mobilized mm -hmm. in 2018 aimed to help communities to adapt to climate change. Building on that, um, not agreeing the extension of the long-term climate finance mandate at COP25 was a major problem. It was a deficiency in that negotiation. What are your thoughts on the negotiations as we go to Glasgow? Well, I, I believe, um, without prejudging the outcomes of the negotiations, that finance and adaptation may be the success or the failure of Glasgow. I think uh, um, this issue of the 100 billion has to be solved in the, um, thinking that a good way of doing that should be creating a specific platform to deal with that matter so that we have information well, clear and accurate and uh, uh, we find a way forward to this matter. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Cecilia. Um, I'm going to put my next question to Gladys, Brianna and Matsumi. Um, the people most exposed to the pandemic and the resulting economic crisis are all, also those most hurt by climate change impacts in many cases, um, basically the poorest and most vulnerable. How, if at all, has the COVID-19 crisis impacted your country's climate action, both in terms of practicalities, but also in terms of uh, the substantive issues of how to build long-term resilience to shocks and whole of government plannings. What planning, what has COVID-19 taught us for the climate response in short? Gladys, would you like to go first? Thank you, Andrew. That's a very important question. Um, for us uh, specifically, I would say COVID-19 did have a very, very, very um, strong impact on our country, um, especially, and in terms of really staring um, away um, uh, most of the other issues aside from COVID-19, especially um, climate, climate action. So um, I would say we haven't really had much done because of COVID-19 is everything from finance to um, policy decisions to protocols were all sort of set around um, COVID-19 and its impacts. Um, but yet um, people in, in my country um, and other Pacific Island countries um, are, are living literally um, facing climate crisis every single day, like the crisis um, still exists. And yet um, with this new one on board, everyone seemed to have sort of forgotten about it. And that's really, really sad. Um, we've seen um, people uh, still um, sort of struggling to uh, meet demands uh, for basic stuff like food and water because um, they've lost jobs um, or um, also uh, because of sea level rise they do not have enough land for gardening um, so affecting nutrition status of especially children here um, so on top of that with COVID-19 in place that has really really um, affected our country but I, I would say what um, I have really learned from COVID-19 um, is that, you know, this climate crisis still exists. Um, and even with something so small like um, COVID-19, we can see how it can change the world, which means even if we feel like our action um, in this climate crisis is, is still too small, I, I believe there's still hope going forward. And I still, um, believe that we should all be fighting this fight and um, your support from across the world especially will be needed um, to voice the concerns of people like us that are directly impacted by climate change. Thank you so much Gladys. Uh, Matsumi, can I go to you next? How would you answer that question about what we've learned from the pandemic in relation to climate action for your country, for Lesotho? Um, thank you, Andrew. Actually, I will speak more broadly in the context of the LDCs as we work with a couple of them um, and highlight a few things that um, uh, have come out from them. Uh, many of them, of course, were working towards producing their NAPs uh, with their goal of having those NAPs by the end of 2020, as well as updating their NDCs. Uh, and these activities uh, go along with a lot of uh, stakeholder processes or consultations 
and a lot of these activities were clamped because of the COVID-19 uh, impact on how countries do their work. So for some countries, they experience delays on issues related to this. Uh, second, also, some of the countries financing from the Green Climate Fund and other sources, they were starting to launch uh, specific activities. Cecilia mentioned an important part that uh, climate finance, especially for adaptation, is a key issue. But even in instances where you had finance on the ground, countries would simply not be able to advance activities that would make their societies a lot more resilient to climate change. So that's another part. Uh, the other part is that you find that the technical work at the national level actually happens through uh, interministerial collaboration and such kind of uh, activities. And um, there are many examples, including countries where they had to address uh, some of the feedback or improve their documents. Uh, this was not possible. And for LDCs, uh, internet is not as a, a especially when we have to, uh, national agencies working together at the national level. And it means that effectiveness in delivery uh, was greatly uh, affected in these cases. Um, and also the COVID uh, also impacted the, the provision of support because many of the LDCs, of course, in addition to their own resources at the national levels, rely on external support. And we know that that was not possible to extend such support to the countries during this time of the crisis. Uh, and so that brings actually myself to what also what we learned actually from this problem is that um, climate change adaptation cannot wait. The very um, uh, accessible uh, vulnerabilities that COVID brings or the very issues that COVID brings are the very problems that are actually uh, posing severe vulnerabilities in the LDCs themselves. So if we wait on climate change adaptation, it's actually going to result into a crisis that will be bigger than what we have. So this is one of the biggest challenges that we have as a global community. Uh, the second part is that uh, um, it has become evident that um, in the LDCs, we also need to focus a lot more on building the capacity at the, inter at the national level or even at the local levels, uh, because the models that we use, of course, to complement the capacity in the LDCs through external means, uh, as we have seen in 2020, these were not possible. Uh, so it means the LDCs need to be empowered to be able to take action by themselves. And of course, it will also speak to the recent conference from the governmental conference. We had it yes the other day talking about locally led action. And I think these are some of the things we need to look strongly in terms of how do we strengthen actions that would um, help countries to uh, better prepare themselves. And indeed, the GAP report just released recently also does indicate that COVID is going to impose even severe burden to the most vulnerable. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you so much, Matsumi. Brianna, what's your take on what we can learn from pandemic and pandemic response for climate response? Yeah, thanks. I'm going to echo a lot of what Matsumi said. Um, and just over the last several months together with the LDC chair, we've undertaken a bit of research to understand how uh, COVID has impacted the LDC groups um, plans and strategies. Uh, we surveyed the group um, and received responses from over half of the LDC's 46 countries, which was a pretty good uh, sample to get. Uh, we also interviewed several key negotiators, including Cecilia and others uh, who have a lot of knowledge um, about what the uh, LDC circumstances back home and what it takes to engage in climate diplomacy, both on the international front where countries work together, but also the domestic work that goes into coordinating the strategies and plans that are necessary for the global effort. Um, and as Matsumi was saying, the vast majority of the respondents to our survey, 80% said that COVID-19 had delayed their NDC process. Um, most wrote in that NAPS had also been affected, the National Adaptation Plans process. Uh, and then an even higher percent said that other national climate change strategies that were in the works for the country had been delayed as well. Um, and Matsumi was pointing out all the reasons why, the consultations that it takes, the interministerial collaboration that it takes to get these through and um, properly coordinated and discussed and then facilitated through government was largely not possible with COVID. Um, so we did see many delays to what the LDC said at the beginning or before 2020 about which countries were going to be prepared to submit enhanced NDCs this past year were just not able to happen. This probably isn't surprising in terms of uh, COVID's impacts globally, but it does stress again that LDCs are going to face yet another challenge uh, to confront the climate crisis um, and going to need 
greater assistance to being able to um, do the strategies um, or to formulate the strategies to do the work nationally um, with uh, capacity built, but really owned uh, at home. Um, and in order to do that in a COVID safe way is going to be yet another hurdle they have to overcome. Um, so yeah, echo a lot of the points what somebody said. Thank you very, thank you so much. Um, the next question, I'm gonna come back to Cecilia Matsumi for this. Um, we've seen some really important major announcements on carbon neutrality, uh, net zero targets from um, South Korea and Japan, as well as China. Um, the U EU and the UK have set out enhanced NDC targets and more. Um, and we understand now the US is going to try to put its NDC out there before Biden's summit, which will be on Earth Day on the 22nd of April, I believe. So there's a lot of momentum, but is it enough? And additionally, um, more and more developing countries are putting in place national adaptation plans, and some are taking ambitious steps to um, access more climate finance to implement those actions. How do you think the least developed countries are stepping up on enhanced uh, nationally determined contributions, NDCs, and on their national adaptation plans. Um, Cecilia, can I come to you first on that, please? Yes, Andrew, uh, and thank you. Um, well, if it is enough or not, um, I would say no, but of course I would welcome the efforts that countries are putting in place. Uh, but it's important also to um, highlight that LDCs are also increasing ambition on their NDCs and up. Um, but the question will be, uh, will they be financially able to implement what they uh, meant to do? So, um, because many actions on the NDCs are conditional. And um, we know that funding uh, uh, for um, implementation, for the implementation phase for the NAP and for the NDCs uh, uh, will be, uh, will still be the problem for LDCs. Thank you, I think I, I saw. Thank you very much, Cecilia Matsumi. Yes, thank you, Andrew. Actually, I will build on what Cecilia was saying that the, indeed, if we want to be honest, we'll see the progress is a little slow for the LDCs. I mean, this is not to say that uh, the community, we are not doing what we're supposed to be doing, but maybe there's a little bit more that needs to be done. Uh, in the annual progress report that we just produced last year, uh, it shows that there is progress um, across the whole developing countries. But when you look at the LDC statistics themselves, uh, they still struggle with fundamental issues, including on accessing support. So it begs the question on how best can we be able to uh, enhance support and elevate support maybe to the most vulnerable actually so that uh, while we are as a global community making steps forward we are not leaving those that actually don't need to be left behind uh, uh, uh the other thing is that um, in the process of course the LDC expert group under the UNFCCC uh, is undertaking activities including mobilizing a lot of other actors and players to and to see and explore ways on how to address this problem as we just mentioned in that there is a, a lot of support uh, around uh, that one, no doubt. And then there is a lot of programs to support, but you find that there's still fundamental issues. So there's some problems that we are not hitting onto them that need to be addressed. And that I think is, is an area that, that still uh, can be uh, addressed. Uh, the other thing is that we see that when we look at the NDCs, in fact, in this updated set of NDCs, the, the secretary, we did a, a survey across the whole de developing countries and many more countries want to increase the ambition or the way they represent adaptation in their NDCs. Uh, and in, in fact, in the 49 NDCs that we have so far, the updated NDCs, 39 of them from the developing countries, uh, almost all of them prominently feature adaptation in a better way than it was featured in the countries in how to consider adaptation. So there is hope and there is commitment, but I think a little bit more still needs to be done uh, to continue to build on that part. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Cecilia Motumi. The next question I'm going to put to um, Brianna and Gladys, and it's really about the lessons learned from 2020 
at a process level to take into 2021. We still don't really know how much face-to-face -face, um, is going to be possible in the negotiations. So these are re actually really important questions. What did we learn from the virtual dialogues in 2020 and how we can build on those and ensure that we don't lose momentum over 2021 if travel and uh, in-person meetings do remain quite difficult to organize. Brianna, would you like to go first on that? Sure, thanks. Um, so this was something else that we, in our survey, asked uh, least developed country government officials to reflect on. Um, and what we really found was there were some benefits to virtual engagement. Um, they do keep the conversation going. Um, they are a good platform for sharing information. Um, they reach audiences that maybe previous in-person climate dialogues wouldn't have. Uh, and there were some historic firsts in 2020, as you and the chair mentioned in your opening remarks, we had vulnerable developing country groups put on these virtual summits that they had never done before. We had AOSIS, the Small Island States, the Sentia Forum, LDCs, the Tempo Ambition Forum at the end of last year. So there, there were good things to come out of our sh shocking push to virtual engagement. However, um, government officials in the LDCs reported that they had many, many challenges in accessing a lot of these. Um, the overwhelming majority of people we surveyed, so again, 25 countries over half the group, 90% uh, said that internet accessibility affected their ability to participate. Accessibility was, you know, no internet, no signal where they were, etc. The same number said that poor internet quality affected their ability to participate. So that's, you know, low bandwidth, sound doesn't work, video doesn't work, connection drops, etc. Um, so some uh, national focal points of LDC countries reported that in 2020, they could not attend a single virtual discussion, um, which is a huge jump from the super year we thought 2020 was going to be for climate diplomacy. Um, we also had examples, as the chair mentioned in his opening remarks, of LDC representatives to UNFCCC forums needing to withdraw because they simply could not attend the virtual discussions that were meant to keep the conversation going to try and get some work done. Um, they just couldn't access them. The LDC representative from Chad um, to the Climate Technology Center and Networks Advisory Board withdrew. Uh, a representative from Sudan on the WIM, the Warsaw International Mechanism for Loss and Damage, had to withdraw. These connection issues are really fundamental challenges for LDCs to engage in virtual diplomacy. Um, that being said, we look ahead and we really don't know if in person is going to be possible. So what do we do? The connection challenge is not insurmountable, but it certainly needs attention. And I think the first step is to, you know, we are not all starting from the same baseline when it comes to access to the virtual world. Um, if we are really going to have inclusive climate dialogues and discussions, let alone negotiations or decision making, uh, we really do need to get everybody up to speed in terms of being able to access the virtual world. And that really starts with the world's poorest countries, the ones who are most impacted by climate change as priority. Um, so I'll stop there. Thanks so much, Brianna. And that really should be on the to-do list for, for donor agencies interested in a good outcome from COP26 this year. So thanks very much for making that point so powerfully. Um, Gladys, you spoke a bit about some of the positive elements of virtual engagement earlier in 2020. What do you think are the lessons going into 2021? Thanks, Andrew. Um, I think Brianna pretty much gave a really clear picture of what that um, looks like for this. Um, but from a personal level, um, being, you know, um, attending to events that were held virtually, um, it is very challenging. Um, uh, especially coming from an, a country where um, telecommunication is still um, an issue um, that is yet to be solved. Um, but it is not impossible, I'd say that first. Um, if going forward, I feel um, as part of our discussions to enhance climate action, I think it's very important first off to make sure that um, national governments um, ensure that our telecommunications are working well, um, especially now with COVID, like, I don't think it's going away. I think we'll have to deal with it for some time still. Um, so that is um, really needed so that people um, from countries that are really directly affected by climate change are in discussions like this. 
Um, uh, and I also, I also feel that the other challenging thing was um, the time differences. So having to connect with people from all over the world, um, sometimes I'd have to be up at 3 a.m. I think sometimes that puts people off. So that's um, um, part of the reason why they may have to um, uh, withdraw from conversations like this. Um, but I guess it comes back to, to oneself as well. Um, how much are you willing to commit to um, making you know, action for this, uh, in this climate crisis? Um, and for me personally, um, you know, with everything that my country has gone through and in least developed countries, um, I think now more than ever is the opportunity for us to um, take more stand in this action, use this crisis to our advantage to lead more sustainable um, practices going forward. Uh, yeah, so I think that's from me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gladys. Um, I'm going to put my last question back to the whole panel, um, which is about looking forward to 2021. Um, what are the signals needed in 2021 to get the ambition we need, both in the year and in the decade coming, to show real tangible change is happening at the scale and rate required? Um, Cecilia, would you like to go first on that? Um, yeah, thank you, Andrew. I, I think... Um, um, we have to see that all the events uh, taking place in 2021 are aiming to have action on the ground, uh, despite the situation we are all facing. Um, and uh, of course, I think we have to join efforts and not duplicate it in the different forums. Um, and of course, focusing on the objective we want to achieve and um, for that, of course, Glasgow um, will be a place where we must want to achieve a very good objective. And uh, I would um, highlight again that uh, um, adaptation in finance um, will need special attention uh, during negotiations so that we have the very good results um, for this, uh, for the COP26. These are my, my uh, points. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cecilia. Um, Brianna, can I come to you next? What would be your take of the signals that we need in 2021? Thanks. Um, well, I think if 2020 has taught us anything, it's that uh, we need to tackle 2021 differently than most of us planned. Um, and adapt to everything that's come our way. I don't think we can address one crisis in isolation from another. Um, and really we need to take a kind of governments need to rethink climate diplomacy and diplomacy in general um, to confront the many crises we're facing. So climate change, biodiversity loss, pandemic, uh, all of which exacerbate inequality, uh, as you said, Andy, and the challenges countries face to develop sustainably. So we really need to look at these all together. Um, as COVID-19 seems to be the imminent threat that many governments are trying to recover from, what we need are COVID recovery packages that account for nature, climate, people, um, that really put forward a plan that's gonna help us achieve all of the goals we have set in the Paris Agreement and under other conventions uh, that are hoping to have a super year this year um, and get the kind of results we need. Um, so in addition to green COVID-19 packages, recovery packages, particularly from the highest emitters, we do need plans that really lay forward the sustainable future we want. Um, those are not just NDCs and NAPs, but long-term strategies that get us to net zero um, and really take seriously the challenges we face. Thank you so much, Brianna. Gladys, what would be your top wishes for 2021? Thank you, Andrew. Um, uh, personally, what I think um, COVID-19 uh, really has um, sort of hit us to rock bottom, I would say, globally. But at the same time, um, it is an opportunity for us to ha um, start a new beginning amidst this crisis to help us to rethink the strategies that we've sort of had in place before for climate action and um, help us to um, start off on a more greener um, uh, angle going forward instead of going back to the old normal. So taking this new normal as, as our way forward. 
Um, and Glasgow, definitely COP26 must happen this year. Um, and I feel that um, it is the most personal stories of loss and damage that needs to be amplified at that kind of level, especially with Glasgow. Um, so something um, IIED has been doing, which I was part of, um, you know, just reporting um, stories that um, of people who, who are at the front line and amplifying the stories so that they can back the scientific evidence we have um, before we uh, make decisions for climate actions going forward. I think that can really um, engage more of an audience all around the world to, and gain more support. Um, I just feel uh, one thing that COVID-19 also taught us is the power of people. Um, despite the pandemic and all the different crises that we are facing one way or the other, uh, when people stick together, we, we always come to find a way. And I think we should all um, take that going forward. Thank you very much, Gladys. Um, Matsumi, um, do you want to add anything in terms of your top wishes for 2021, the signals we need? Indeed. Um, on what Cecilia was emphasizing, the need to set very clear and good objectives. I think the LDC group chair in his uh, opening remarks, he did indicate that uh, uh, we need to achieve the immediate uh, term goals uh, and this speaks to the issue of setting goals. I think both in the long term, um, and in a classical example for the long term goals, the LDCs have the LDC Vision 2050, which defines what the LDCs want envision to be uh, in 2050. And in order to arrive at that, of course, there are actions that need to be implemented to arrive at that. And those actions need resources, need financing for them to be implemented. And to implement or to get those resources, plans are required behind that. So there needs to be a clear indication of uh, these the, tangible milestones that need to be achieved now that we are in the phase of the real action to address, address the climate problem. The second issue is on uh, the promotion of coherence across the different agenda. Of course, the Paris Agreement already provides very good links to sustainable development, but we do know that also the landscape is big now and we're talking about so many things that countries have to worry about at the national level. There is the issues around biodiversity, the issues around disasters, et cetera. And there is a need for coherence on how countries address their development issues, plus this uh, additional crisis. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Matsumi, and huge thanks to the panel. That was a really rich discussion. Um, and it's brilliant that we have Hugh Davis with us from the COP26 team. And before we turn to the Q&A from the audience, I'd like to ask you, um, who's been listening to the conversation, um, it would be great to hear how the UK is factoring in some of these concerns from LDCs in the planning for the COP and its presidency of COP26. Um, and by the way, when we move to Q&A, feel free to direct questions to you as well as to our other panellists. Hugh, thanks so much for joining us. No problem at all, Andrew. Thanks very much for having me here. I'm really pleased to be here to represent uh, the UK and COP26 unit. Um, this is one of the most important groups that we work with. Uh, we work with you a lot and the, the, LD, the LDC group, and uh, that will be so important in the year ahead. So, yeah, thank you again. Um, there, there's been a lot of rich content there, so excuse me if I'm referring to my notes a bit. Um, and yeah, just to remind everyone who, who doesn't know me, I'm, I'm, I'm Hugh Davis, Deputy Lead Negotiator for COP26. Uh, I've been working on the UNFCCC and COPs for about five years and, and was uh, very proud to be part of the UK team in, in Paris as well. So I've been around for a bit and, and know quite a few of you, some familiar, familiar faces that I'm seeing here, which is great. Um, I, I think in, in summary from, from what I'm hearing, I, I, I think looking back to last year, if we look back to last March when the COP Bureau had to make the decision to postpone COP26, I think overall our expectations for 2020 were all quite low. Uh, we had a lot of concerns about what, the progress that could be made and there was a lot of calls for how, how do we maintain our, our action and, and ambition. Um, and I think if I look back now, we, we made more progress than we were expecting. Um, there, there was more action, there were more commitments, but um, uh, in particular through events that, um, that took the conversation forward, like, uh, like the mock COP that Gladys mentioned, like the Placentia Ambition Forum, like the Tim Poo Ambition Summit, um, and also the Climate Ambition Summit that we hosted in, in December. I don't think at that point in March, when we had to postpone COP26, 
we thought that we would see 70 world leaders coming together on a virtual platform in December, making new commitments around uh, mitigation, around adaptation, around finance. Um, so I think that there, there, were, there were positive signs there. Um, and as well as those, those commitments um, that you pointed out, Andrew, that the different parties have made. Um, but have we done enough? Did we see enough in 2020? Uh, no. Um, and, and so for me, what we need to look forward to in 2021, and I'll, I'll come to this a bit more, is, is essentially we need all countries, all parties to deliver on their commitments. We've all made good commitments. We've made those in Paris. We've made those since. And we need to deliver on those. Um, and that's not just in the, the NDCs and the long-term strategies, but as Cecilia pointed out, that, that's on finance and that's on adaptation as well. Uh, and if we can collectively live up to those commitments, then that's the sort of progress that we need to see in, in, in 2021 uh, and, and beyond. Um, and so in terms of our kind of plans and expectations for COP26 and, and, and the year ahead, it really does focus around those areas as, as the COP26 president set out in his speech in, in December. We're, we're looking to make progress and, and, and on not just mitigation, but finance and adaptation. And also the fourth area that we've highlighted, which is on cooperation. Um, and as you might be aware, we've highlighted some thematic campaigns to take forward through, uh, through the year leading up to COP26, where essentially the, the point of them is that we can all collectively make more progress towards those goals and, and those targets that we've set ourselves, uh, particularly in Paris, focused around uh, sectors such as uh, electric vehicles and around energy, um, but also around those key areas such as adaptation and resilience and finance. Um, which can't be left behind. Um, but my area of, of focus is obviously on the negotiations, so I'll, I'll speak to that a bit more now. Um, as I say, I, I think um, we achieved a lot last year, more than we thought we could in terms of uh, set pieces so that on the ocean and land dialogues um, and bringing together some of the uh, constituted bodies for, to make progress on their areas of work. Um, but we do want to see more, more going forward. Um, uh, and we'll need all parties on, on board to do that. I think the leadership that the LDCs have shown so far um, in coming together as a group, as coordinating and, and, and being a, a strong voice has been hugely important. And so I hope we see that, that going forwards. Um, and also that we see more from parties in terms of speaking to each other directly as well. Uh, we're trying to facilitate that in a variety of ways. Um, over the next couple of days, we'll be bringing together heads of delegation uh, from all parties and groups uh, to share views on, on the year ahead, because it's important whilst we've run many rounds of consultations with parties and groups over the last year and heard uh, um, what parties have been saying, and I'll come to that a bit more in a moment in terms of what we'll be hoping to deliver for the LDCs. What we are concerned about in the virtual settings is that there hasn't been enough opportunity for parties to talk to each other and understand where they're coming from. And as you'll all know, in a COP and in a multilateral process, you need that understanding of, of where different um, countries positions are. Um, through all that, um, and I, I should say as well that we're very lucky and, and proud that we now have a full-time COP26 president on this. Um, our Prime Minister recognised the importance of that role and uh, that we needed a, a cabinet minister, a powerful minister in charge of COP26 throughout the year. Um, so Alok Sharm will be playing that role and he uh, has been stepping up over the last few weeks, uh, consulting directly with the different groups, uh, in, including uh, Sunam and, and the LDC group um, in the last week to make sure that he is cited exactly on what the party's uh, concerns are. Um, and that will uh, sit alongside, as I say, different multilateral meetings that we, we will hold as well. And what we hope to achieve through that is obviously that we del deliver on all the mandated work that the UNFCCC has um, on the rule book that's needed to bring Paris to light, to life. Um, but also uh, on a package in Glasgow that speaks to the concerns of all parties uh, across adaptation and, and finance as well. Um, and that's something that we, we've heard consistently for, from all parties. Um, so, yeah, we, we need to continue that good work, continue that openness um, to make sure that we make that progress over the year ahead. Um, in terms of what we've heard specifically from, from you and the LDC group uh, and how we hope to address that, um, I... 
unfortunately this meeting's come about a week too early because I hope to have some exciting news for you soon uh, about a, a, a ministerial event that we will be holding soon which will hope to uh, focus on and, and shine a light on issues that we've heard from parties as being very important uh, like um, access to finance, uh, the mobilisation of finance, how we address climate impacts um, and uh, also the issue of, of debt as well. Um, we don't plan to do this uh, as a formal UNFCCC event because we hope it can have a broader impact. Uh, you'll be aware that we're also the, the chair of the G7 this year. We work with our partners Italy on COP26, who are the chairs of the G20. And we think those sorts of issues that are important to the LDC group don't just have a home in the UNFCCC, but also have a home beyond. Um, so that's what we'll be looking to do over the next couple of months. So watch this space on that. Hope to have some more exciting and, and clear news uh, for you on that. Um, also, we we'll hope to be taking forward uh, uh, new programmes and partnerships that, that address specific issues. Um, and crucially, what we're committed to is th this. We really do want this to be the most inclusive COP ever um, and make sure that every voice is heard, but particularly the voice of the most vulnerable uh, and make sure that there are no rooms or discussions take place without those voices being heard. And that's why it's so good for us that we have such a close relationship with the, this group uh, and have been working together over the years and, and we'll continue that um, in the year ahead. Um, just if I may, on, on my last point, um, Gladys mentioned that in spite of uh, the horrible events that her country experienced last year, she still has hope. Um, and I think sort of going back to the point I made, if we see this year countries continuing to deliver on the commitments they've already made, then what we can do with COP26 is really make that a, a lightning rod for hope uh, and make that a positive moment that we can, we can springboard off to in the decade ahead. Thank you so much, Hugh. Great to hear that commitment to making COP26 the most inclusive COP ever and to seeing the voices of the vulnerable of the small island states and the LDCs and others um, in every forum in the COP. Um, it's really great to hear that. Um, and thanks so much for joining us. I think we're moving now to the Q&A um, and we've got a, a good set of questions coming in. Um, and. Uh, let me start with um, a, an interesting question to Brianna about the survey you mentioned. Um, one of the common causes among negotiators and climate professionals the world over is the increased challenges of juggling childcare, elder care and other unpaid care work with professional paid work, particularly obviously for women negotiators. Did this come up in your survey at all? Does it compound other pressures such as connectivity issues? Um, and that's from Marie Dupa from CDK and ODI. Thanks, um, great question. And yes, this did come up quite a bit in the survey. Um, several people wrote in that uh, even if they had access or <laughs> clear Wi-Fi connections, the ability to juggle their normal duties um, with these virtual summits that were often arranged uh, at non-convenient uh, time zones and often right in a row as well, was it was just not feasible to then attend everything. There was also a very common response that um, when negotiations tended to happen, you would go somewhere and be away from your normal work so that you could go and focus on the negotiations. Without that separation, there wasn't a clear time to engage in this. And often the national work that was needing to be done and especially complicated by COVID also got in the way of uh, trying to engage outside of your own role. Um, there were also complications about where people had access, so needing to travel within the country to get a secure connection um, and that being difficult to do after dark or with trying to care for family members, etc. It just wasn't feasible then. So a lot of the proposals on how to address this looked at can we book hotel rooms in capitals that have secure connections and allow, but still allow people to go somewhere to fully concentrate and engage and have a secure connection when these dialogues are happening? Um, can we do things that uh, accommodate the need for care and um, 
the regular government duties, uh, getting someone to help with those so that, you know, there's a separate line of work between engaging in international discussions uh, and doing the things that people need to do when they're at home. Um, this came up quite a bit. So yes, in answer to your question, there are things that we could do about this if, uh, as Hugh and others are saying, um, we're looking at a future where negotiations and decision making does need to take place virtually. How is it we can make sure everyone is A, connected and B, has the space to really engage in these conversations? Thank you so much, Rihanna. Um, really fascinating detail there and it's a key issue. Um, this, I think, one from James Hewitt. Um, I'm being assisted in the, but I take it this is the top voted question. And it's an interesting one, but also a challenging one. Um, it's James's question. The UK has failed to meet the first five-year commitment it agreed in Paris uh, 2015 in its NDC. UK intends to propose nature-based solutions rather than steep reductions in carbon emissions, seeing that as business as usual and in a sense um, sort of there is this argument that nature-based solutions can be used as a cover for avoiding genuine action on mitigation. So does the panel consider that the argument against um, false nature-based solutions should start now and reach a crescendo pr prior to COP26? Now, Hugh, I know you're speaking to the presidency here rather than specifically for the UK, but there's an obvious link here to Article 6 and to the work on markets. I mean, do you have any thoughts about um, how nature-based solutions could be real rather than fake and what this means in terms of countries' mitigation commitments? Thanks, Andrew. And yeah, you're exactly right. I'm here, I'm here representing the presidency, so I'm, I'm in some ways speaking on behalf of all parties, so I, I, I will temper my comments in, in that mode. Um, I think it's a, very, it's a very good question. I think the links to the negotiated elements you, you pointed out are, are, are right, and that's something we hear from parties, and something we hear consistently is the need for those links, however they develop and however they're agreed and finalised in Glasgow. They need environmental integrity. That, that is key. Uh, and I think we saw that and heard that, heard that loud and clear uh, in in Madrid, actually, and that that was very positive, and I think that that will continue next year. So I think I think that that is a fairly established principle um, that um, that we hear consistently from parties. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, as I say, I won't comment on on the the questioner's um, observations uh, about uh, UK commitments, uh, but I, I would say I mean I, I think we all want all solutions to be uh, real. Um, and the idea of a false solution is uh, is a slight paradox to me. So I, th I think we're all on the same page there. Thanks very much, Hugh. Does anyone have any thoughts from the other side in terms of, I mean, Article 6 is about carbon markets. It's these contentious areas such as offsets and so on. Um, I mean, the LDCs have been particularly forthright on the need to maintain the integrity uh, the environmental integrity of the agreement, but does anyone have any sense of that? Um, that Article 6 has been obviously probably the toughest area in the negotiations, hasn't moved for a long time. Um, there's some hope it may move in the run up to COP26, but um, Matumi or Cecilia, do you have any thoughts on what we might need to see in that area? Well, Article 6, so we, we all a lot of, about this uh, agenda. I uh, particularly don't follow, uh, but uh, yes, I think it needs uh, uh, more um, um, attention um, from all of us during the discussions. Uh, um, I, I completely um, do not follow this um, article, um, this agenda item specifically, but I feel from my colleagues who follow the agenda item and uh, um, sometimes I feel like the uh, um, um, issue is not moving forward. So um, without uh, um, making uh, any make, I will not uh, um, agree or disagree <laughs> um, with, uh, with the way uh, we should uh, um, Take this uh, agenda item back to. I think Bob uh, 
uh, solutions. I, I, I would not believe in false uh, or um, solutions. Both solutions can be considered since it comes and, and, and solve the problem. Yeah, it's kind of a watch this space area, I think, but I'm sure it's going to get much more intense over, over the months to come. Um, and the next question is from Ineza Umhuhosa Grace, who we know well, who she um, from Green Fighter in Rwanda, um, a, a really um, dynamic youth activist. Um, and Ineza's question is, LDCs have experienced loss and damage induced by climate change. For example, in Rwanda, heavy rains are washing away people's hope for economic development. What are the existing mechanisms available for LDCs to have access to green recovery finance from COVID, um, but also accessing the finance needed to protect the vulnerable from climate impacts? Um, Brianna, do you want to have a go at that? Thanks. Um, teams get others' views as well. Uh, the loss, well, first to say the loss, loss and damage is a key uh, priority for the least developed countries going into COP26. Um, there was progress made at COP25 on the mechanisms that Inez is asking about. Um, a Santiago network was agreed, or the Santiago network was agreed um, to kind of facilitate information sharing about loss and damage and get a network of experts kind of up and running available to help countries um, who are facing loss and damage uh, and other climate impacts. The finance for these mechanisms um, is still something that is hotly negotiated or up for negotiation. Um, and is a priority of to get access to from least developed countries. We know that the least developed countries struggle to access climate finance, uh, as Matsui and the chair and others have pointed out, really less than 20% of climate finance ends up with LDCs. And we don't imagine that finance for loss and damage would be any different unless significant action was taken uh, to make it so. Um, so that's kind of where we are with the negotiations. Um, but yeah, I would welcome Matsumi and others and Hugh's inputs as well in terms of what the COP presidency is thinking about how to address kind of outstanding issues and loss and damage or move this forward as a priority area for vulnerable countries. Yeah, Hugh, do you want to come in on that, the COP's approach on uh, loss and damage? Yeah, I guess there's a couple of uh, approaches to that. I mean, Brianna mentioned at the end there in, in terms of uh, delivering on, on sort of what's been agreed through the mandates. And I mean, that's certainly what, what we hope to do and what we're hearing from parties that everything that's been uh, agreed that will be agreed, uh, we hope to deliver in Glasgow. The question is whether that um, matches with the, the expectations and desires of, of a number of, of parties as well. So we'll need to balance that. I think, as I said, I, I hope that if we are here in a few months time and looking back at the first half of this year, there'll be more to say because this is an area that we want to, to give more space to. It, it, it is complex. Uh, and there, one of the issues is that different language is used by different people to, to describe similar or overlapping um, solutions. Um, and I think that's something we, we hope to address as well is make sure that in, in looking at these, the, the most complex problems, we're all speaking the same language so that we, could, we can make progress. Um, so yeah, I, this is something we're focused on, um, and we've heard loud and clear from from LDCs, uh, from SIDS uh, during our incoming presidency, and uh, we we hope that we'll uh, we'll make progress over the coming months and the rest of the year. Thanks very much, Hugh. Does anyone else want to come in on that? Matsumi, yeah, please. Do. Yeah, just briefly, Andrew. Um, just uh, to, maybe to take the last part of the question, which talks about the uh, protecting the vulnerables. Uh, from the impact, which maybe talks more from the preemptive space uh, before we go into the loss of damage. Just to emphasize the point I was making that um, uh, the LDC expert group actually this year, what they are trying to do with the LDCs is to try to work with them, including of course with many other partners to support each LDC to, sub to at least prepare and submit the project proposal for any of the key vulnerable areas and, and the, the, the one thing that they're trying to work through is to see whether countries can think of that um, uh, critical areas that you know that these are the, the most way the countries can experience the most impacts and then prepare those and bundle them into programs they can probably implement some actions on those. So 
of course, it has to be that level of planning and trying to, uh, to, 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 to put in place those measures that would be, and, and finance, of course, through the GCF and many other channels is uh, available. I guess, of course, we are talking about the difficulties, but it's more about how do we get together and assist the LDCs with the constraints that they have, that they can have access to the finance that's available and start to implement measures that would see us, at least in the next coming years, speaking less of these catastrophic uh, impacts to the LDCs. Thank you very much, Matsumi. Um, the next question is from Alan Nichol. Um, he notes and um, commends Hugh's emphasis on inclusivity for, the, for COP26, which is great. Um, and his question is, is there a way COP26 can help bring the energy of climate activism into deliberations and actions going forward? Is there a way to bridge the divide between actors and negotiators and policymakers? Gladys, do you want to offer some thoughts on that? It is also very challenging as I feel um, even in this climate space, people have very different um, opinions as to how we, sh we should um, tackle um, the solutions um, here. Uh, but definitely from my side, what I feel um, is very important is um, to really, really amplify, as Inez also mentioned um, in a question, um, the loss and damage, which I really hope COP26 promotes um, more um, and have more personal stories of um, people that are affected by climate change um, directly um, at COP26. And I feel like that should be the bridge um, between science um, that people are, are aware of and some people not, but then also to the reality that people are going through on the ground. Thank you very much. Um, anybody else want to offer some thoughts on that? Hugh, um, coming back to you, but the activist bridge to the COP, do you have any planning for that, for how that can be facilitated? Yeah, I think that the, there's various um, options developing. Um, I think what we've seen or, or felt that this has been one of the positive stories of the last year, actually. Um, what we saw with events like, and, and Matsumi referenced this earlier, with the June Momentum and, and the climate change dialogues, we actually saw a gr far higher participation in particular types of events from a wider variety uh, of, of observer groups, uh, NGOs uh, and, and activists, as you say, um, although I like to think we're all active. Um, but uh, so I, I think that there's opportunities in the way that we're working now to, to bring in different views in a different way. Um, obviously, anything that we do at a COP has to be with agreement of, of all the parties and the COP Euro uh, and that sort of more dry process that, that needs to lead up to it. But certainly in terms of the options that are there, we're, we're exploring them. Uh, we're seeing things in events like this and, and, and various different summits that I mentioned earlier um, that really have allowed us a, a sort of quite a rich uh, testing ground if you like, um, to see how different views can be brought into the conversation um, and then taken on. So that, that's something I'm, I'm very optimistic about for this year, um, because I think we've seen a, a lot of progress even in the, in the last nine months in, 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 that, in that space. Thank you very much, Hugh. Um, okay, the next question is from Sana Ilias. Um, how do panelists consider that ecosystem-based adaptation to enhance community capacities towards disaster resilience can be mobilized. Does anyone want to offer any thoughts on that, on ecosystem-based adaptation? It may not be a specialism for any of our panelists, but um, anybody want to have a go? Um, yes, uh, some uh, um, small thoughts on that. Um, well, we call it EBA. <laughs> E EBA um, helps uh, communities uh, um, putting in place adaptation action. So um, I think it's a, it's a very important way um, in part of adaptation that should still be considered and uh, um, and funded. Because even um, actions. Uh, applying EBA needs to be funded and communities are the most vulnerable. They don't have how to do that. Governments uh, um, normally, they don't uh, fund specifically adaptation actions. Of course, um, they fund uh, uh, small communities um, to solve the local problem and people is doing that and some of those actions are adaptation. 
but um, of course we need to, and it passes to the adaptation planning process and the NAPS uh, countries are, are, are um, uh, designing um, that will allow to proper uh, uh, um, specify the actions in communities and what can be done uh, uh, using EBA for uh, communities. So it's something that needs attention and needs to be highlighted when it comes to fund for those type of actions. I think it can, uh, um, it should be more considered. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Cecilia. Um, Brianna, a question about the US being back in the Paris Agreement. What's your reading of the future of US contributions to climate finance? That's from Mizan Khan, um, an ICAG colleague. Hi, Mizan. <laughs> Good to hear from you. Um, US and climate finance. Well, uh, I am certainly more hopeful than I was even a couple of months ago, given that this all branches of Congress are now within democratic control, um, that we could see real comprehensive action on climate finance, um, and that extends beyond what can be done through executive order. Um, though I think the rules in the Senate are still to be worked out on how a 50-50 split actually relates to legislation. Um, so I I guess I don't know um, right now uh, how much climate finance we can legitimately expect from the Biden administration. I certainly wish and hope that the US at least fulfills the commitments they made in the Obama administration on climate finance and moves us towards what would be a fair share for US contributions in the climate finance space. Um, I know Biden has ambitious plans but his ability to actually implement them remains to be seen. Um, and even those really uh, are not enough. I would love to see the US um, really focus on supporting the most vulnerable countries in their climate finance efforts, which hasn't been a focus to date. Um, and I think if they are truly interested in a just uh, transition and just solutions for cl the climate crisis, that's what they need to prioritize. Thank you very much indeed, Brianna. I'm going to go back now. The final question, which is our top voted question, comes back to the issue of loss and damage. There's obviously been a huge amount of interest in that. And it's from Inez Omahosa again, from Rwanda, from Green Party of Rwanda. And it's to you, Hugh. Will this be the COP where loss and damage will be recognized and addressed with a sense of urgency? Or will it be the COP where we, as the global community, will have an opportunity for more policies without a clear plan on how to protect the vulnerable exposed to climate change impacts. So again, it's about how you see the loss and damage issue landing at COP26. Thanks, and it's a really well-framed question. Okay, um, I, need to, I need to be cautious about what we hear behind closed doors, but I think what I can say is that what we've heard to date is that parties are still far apart on how they address this issue and how they uh, how how they prioritise it in terms of what they want to see in Glasgow. Um, as I said, over the next couple of days, we're bringing together all heads of delegation. We, we hope to get a clearer idea of what all parties want to achieve in Glasgow, and that that's and and to say that to each other, um, and that will be a jumping off point um, that we can take through the rest of the year. Um, I think, as I said before, it's really important that we continue to hear parties priorities loudly and strongly uh, externally into each other and this is one of those areas um, but uh, in terms of the framing that the questioner was putting to us is that where all parties are at the moment no um, and it will take uh, it will take uh, sharing of positions uh, it will take fresh ideas uh, and it will take uh, ideas and solutions um, from a broad range of, of actors and activists um, to get to that place. Um, obviously, I, I don't have a, a personal view. Um, I, I can merely try and facilitate where parties come, but at the moment, they're, they're not there in that same space. Thank you very much indeed, Hugh. Um, I think we're, we're probably out of time now for more questions, but let me say a few words and then give anyone on the panel an opportunity to come back with some final thoughts. 
I think some of the things that have come out really strongly, I mean, huge thanks to the panel. Um, it was really um, an important discussion, I think. But the emphasis on adaptation finance coming through for the least developed countries was really strong from Atsumi and from Cecilia as a key element that we need to see building up towards COP26. Um, funding for adaptation and resilience in the poorest countries and the loss and damage element as still to land, as you were saying, um, but is obviously also critical there. Um, some countries, I particularly was struck by Gladys's point that um, her country um, had seen 20 deaths from a climate event, a climate catastrophe, um, but no deaths from COVID. So some countries are in real time experiencing the impacts of climate change and being hit much harder by that than by the pandemic. Um, so it's, um, that's a critical point to take on board, particularly when in many rich countries, um, the pandemic in many ways, the death rates are higher in a lot of OECD and rich countries than they are in many countries in the global south. So it's really important that we get that perspective also from the global south where many countries have actually handled the pandemic um, quite well um, as, a, as a health emergency, even if they've been hit by its economic impacts. Um, this theme of finding recovery funding um, coming out of the pandemic, but also to fund climate action is really, really important. We haven't touched much on the debt theme, um, but we can see possibly a buildup of debt in many poor countries over the coming year or so as their their markets and their exports and even industries like tourism are really seriously hit by the pandemic. So that is something we need to come back to, all different kinds of ways of funding a green recovery on a global scale. Um, and I particularly also liked the point about the need for a long-term vision. I think that was from Matsumi, talking about the LDC's long-term vision, but how that vision can't be made material without resources and without short-term plans to move us forward. Um, and finally, just to again say we were, how delighted I was to hear Hugh talk about the ambition of the COP presidency to make this the most inclusive COP ever, and also to thank you for coming here and engaging with some of the tough issues like markets and loss and damage in the build up to that. So it's been a great session. Many thanks to all of you. Does anyone want to have a final word after my final words? Stick your hand up if you do. Yes, Gladys. Thank you, um, Andrew. Um, I just wanted to say, um, just in addition to what Brianna was saying, first of all, congratulations to the US for um, slanging back on with the Paris Agreement. Um, just on behalf of us um, here in the Pacific, this is a very critical um, step forward, um, especially with, um, you know, on a global scale, um, America being very influential, but also I'd, I'd really like America to continue encouraging um, or working closely with the government of Australia, as we sort of look up to Australia as big brothers, I'd say. Um, and so if, if we can have Australia on board as well, really strong in terms of climate action, then that would really, really help the Pacific Islands, um, and especially um, small island developing states here. Yeah, hopefully Australia also has an eye on China, South Korea and Japan, who've recently made uh, progressive commitments as well. Um, any other thoughts, uh, Brianna? Just, just jumping on the bandwagon with that um, and wanted to go back to something Hugh said. I think countries talking directly to each other is something that is really needed in 2021. Um, and hopefully it can help move countries forward, particularly the ones who need to be moved forward uh, to be more ambitious in their climate thinking. Um, so I would welcome that uh, and again echo the um, praise from Andy about wanting to have the most inclusive COP ever in COP26 and just wanted to say thank you to um, LBC colleagues who joined us today, Gladys, Celia, Matsomi, it's so great to see you and hear from you. It's been ages since we've seen each other in person so it's just nice to see your faces um, I, and thanks everyone for attending in the lively discussion. So, yeah. Thanks very much. Cecilia, do you want to come in as well? We've got a minute or two left. Please do. Thank you, uh, uh, to thank you for organizing um, this uh, um, firm where we all can share ideas. Um, and uh, to say that, yes, it's important we all work together to, uh, at the end, uh, 
COP26 a success to all of us. Um, I think not only for the UK because all of us are part of it. Um, and that you organize more spaces like this where we can talk, <laughs> where we can talk about it. Thank you again for the invitation and thank you to all participants. Well, thank you so much to all our panelists for your great contributions to Cecilia Silva Bernardo, um, to Matsumi Malajani, to Gladys Habu, to Brianna Kraft, and to Hugh Davis from the COP26 team as well. So let me close with that with huge thanks to all our panelists and to everyone who participated. Thank you.